Hey Habit, um, welcome to service. Uh, for those of you just coming in, please come and fill up the front rows. Um, yeah, it's really just such a joy to see so many of you all here today. Um, and yeah, uh, before we start, you know, now we have the confession like at the start. Um, so, you know, before we go into that time of confession or into the time of worship even, uh, can I just invite you guys, just take the next about two minutes or so just take some space with the Lord. You know, we, we all come from busy weeks uh, where we've, you know, filled up our schedules and there's not much time left uh, to really just sit in silence and communion with the Lord. Um, so yeah, can we all just take these two minutes, just close your eyes, don't look around. You know, we dim the lights for a reason. Uh, and yeah, just talk to the Lord. Ask Him what is on His heart today. Because, uh, you know, there's no such thing as half-hearted worship. Um, so, you know, if you're not sure what to pray, maybe you can just ask the Lord, what is the thing that is stopping me from coming to you with a whole heart of worship? Yeah, let's just take about two minutes. So if you just come in and we're just spending about two minutes to just sit in his presence and just ask him you know, what is stopping us from worshipping today. Distracted people living in the distracted world. We choose to come here today to give you this time because you deserve it. Yeah, Lord, you know, we're, we're sorry for all the times that we've thought we found something better than you. You know, Lord, because that's not possible. Because you are goodness, you are love, you are our hope, you are our joy. Say the confession together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name Amen. Amen Almighty God who forgives all who truly repent have mercy upon you pardon and deliver you from all your sins confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen Reading from Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing I ask of the Lord, that will I seek. 
to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Can I just invite us to rise as we enter a time of worship? We're going to be singing House of the Lord and um, I don't know if you can tell but I've been having a, a sore throat for the past week. So I might, I, I might need quite a bit of help. So please help me sing. Um, but yeah, this song, right, it's, a, it's very hard to sing. Lah. Let's, let's be real. Sometimes it's hard to really believe that there's joy in our lives. Lah. But you know, we just want to declare it over ourselves today that even if we don't feel like it, even if we don't see God working in all these like big miraculous ways, we still want to say, Lord, there's joy here. There's joy in this house. So yeah, let's sing this together. We want to have that cry in our hearts to 
just seek your face and your face alone. And just like David, Lord, we want to we wanna worship and just abandon one of ourselves. We don't want to stand here and look around and wonder who's watching us sing, who's watching us raise our hands. Lord, will you just help us today just worship with a whole heart? Lord, to just sing and to dance like there's no one watching us. So as you sing this next song, just will you just sing this over yourself? Oh, I feel. Oh, I feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know. But when the world, but when the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy, like we're dancing now. You sing. We're dancing now I could sing of your love forever We could sing of your love Sing it to him Sing of your beauty over the mountains. Your river runs with love for me 
And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in truth And I will daily lift my hands And I will always sing of when your love came down Good singer of the love, oh infinite love that welcomes me, but by your blood. invite you to raise your hands to the Lord if you feel that you could love him better that he is worthy of more than you're giving him right now trying to raise your hands is a sign of surrender the Lord I want to love you more My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I did not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus.
Okay, heartbeat. Now we're going to go into time of prayer. So, Ashlyn has prepared some prayer pointers, but maybe we can all remain in a prayerful position as she shares. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay, the slides are up. Um... So our first prayer pointer is um, praying for relationships. Uh, so we can pray for relationships between friends and family uh, to be Christ-centered. And pray also uh, that we set a good example of Christ-likeness in relationships with people that don't know God. And secondly, we can pray for our SJSM village. You know, as we move into a time of new leadership, we pray for God's guidance on our, uh, for our leaders and our ministries. And we pray as well for our nursing home residents to find joy and warmth in the befriending activities, uh, you know, especially since some of them will not have got to celebrate CNY with their families. And uh, lastly, we can pray for the world. As you know, um, the Ukraine war is still going on and it's been quite a long time. So I guess we can pray for uh, God's peace and God's hand in it. So we can take time now to maybe gather in two or threes and pray.
heart beat. Let's close in a time of prayer. So, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this space and time to worship you and also to lift up our needs as well as the needs of those around us. Firstly, we'd like to pray for our relationships with friends and family. We pray that they will be centered in and around you. And we ask that you use our people around us in our lives and that you also use us in their lives. Uh, we pray that we will be able to help each other grow in your word, to pray with and for each other, and as well to keep each other accountable. And we pray for this um, same uh, togetherness and family in heartbeat, and that we can be a shining light on a hill to um, people around us. Secondly, we'd like to lift up our SJSM village. Uh, as we all know, we're going through a time of change, and we pray that God will bless our leaders uh, and that he will continue to guide the church in the direction that he wants to send us. And so, Lord, um, we pray for the mission that you have already blessed us with, uh, that we've been called to bring the mission field right into our compound. I pray for the nursing home residents that they will be able to feel your love, your joy and your warmth through those who are volunteering at the befriending activities. And we pray for those who are volunteering to be empowered by your spirit and to continue living out your love for them. And lastly, we pray, Lord, for the world. Um, the world is currently in a time of unrest, and Lord, you see the pain of your people. And sometimes us here in Singapore might feel a bit distant, uh, a bit distant, and we cannot, ex we don't experience the same devastation that they do. But Lord, I pray that you help us to feel their pain and burden, because we are all children under the same God. And I pray, Lord, um, for those who have been affected by the war in Ukraine, we pray that your love and providence will reach them in their darkest moment. And we pray for the wise decisions um, uh, to be made by the leaders and that you also soften their hearts so that your will will be done. And as uh, we end this prayer and proceed to the service, I pray that we will all receive your message um, through Pastor Daniel with open hearts and minds, and that you also open our eyes and ears to hear you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Alright, welcome Heartbeat. Uh, welcome everyone to Heartbeat Service. I am Ryan Lim from the 2001 batch, uh, one of the older youths. And thank you, Ashlyn, for the wonderful intercession. Can you give her a round of applause? Uh, thanks. Alright, so exciting things have happened. Um, over the past one month, we are officially one month into 2023. Um, and in the coming two months, we'll be embarking on a new series, a uh, World Missions course. Uh, that we'll all be taking part in after service. So instead, instead of going off to your various places for, for cell, you will be staying here. After service, there will be a short break, and then we all come back to attend a uh, world mission course. And it won't be a, just a preaching service. It will be a time to share, and then we'll break off to discuss and break off to pray. So exciting things. Um, it is more than just yet another thing we sit through and listen as Christians, but we are going to use this as a time to be equipped because later on in the year, as Pastor Richard has shared, we will be going forth into missions. And further along in your life, you will be uh, doing missions on your own or with yourself. And we, this course will be a great time for us to... can take a photo, sorry. <laughs> to, to equip yourself to know what uh, foundations we are coming from when we are going forth to, to love and to serve at the communities around us. So take note, next two months, eight Saturdays, uh, it will be in Shalom Hall from 4.30 to 6.15. Yeah. Next. Faith Foundations. Uh, this is basically a course for those who want to be baptized or for those who are baptized as uh, infants. If you want to confirm your... Um, confirm what was done when you were infant, you didn't have a choice. You want to confirm that you, this is where you want to be. You believe that this God is real and this is the God you want to serve. And you want to make a, that formal commitment to Him. This is the course you can go through to be confirmed or baptized. Uh, take note that the registration ends this Monday, 30th of January. So if you're con considering it, please do find out more. Uh, you can approach me or you can approach your cell leaders uh, to find out more about this. Uh, registration ends on Monday and it starts on the 5th of Feb. Next. Funds this week. Woo! 
for those who are uninitiated, uh, the parents, uh, we used to have this tradition of uh, having uh, buns or snacks at the end of service. Uh, but then after we moved from Bethel to here and COVID, I'm not sure what happened actually, but they just stopped. So the parents uh, kind of noticed and out of the, the abundance of their, their love for us, they initiated and funded uh, bun distribution every month. So at the end of every month, the parents will, will donate uh, buns for us to eat after service. Go down, it'll be at uh, Com Hall. Please do remember to thank them for coming down on Saturdays to, to give out this food for us to enjoy. Yeah? Um, I did miss out one thing. If you're here for the first time, uh, please do look out for someone around you and just let them know, just tap them on the shoulder, say, hi, I'm new here, uh, and then let them uh, welcome you to our community. Yep, thank you. Now, we have one more announcement from the Sisterhood. Hi, everyone. This is a rather short um, announcement, but as most of you have known from our very intensive pushing of signups, this morning we actually had our Sisterhood uh, mentorship info session. And yeah, can we have the next slide, please? For those that came, I really just want to thank you all, but um, we do recognize that there's also quite a few of us that are already in mentorships currently and um, didn't come today. And, and we just really want to extend this um, resource to you all. This is a very comprehensive guidebook for mentorship that was written by Jenna and designed by Yeni. It truly is a labor of love that they've put in to this um, guidebook. I know it's a bit lengthy, it's 22 pages long, but I really want to encourage you to sit down and read about it. And um, especially for those of us who are currently in mentorships and we feel like it's been a bit stagnant or you want to branch out in a different way to grow, spiritual disciplines is the, um, something that's been on our hearts and has been on Jenna's heart for a long time and we really want you to um, consider it. And yeah, so um, it goes back to the fundamentals of what God says about mentorship in the Bible, the characteristics of a mentor and mentee and how to nurture this relationship well and to make it more targeted and focused as well. Um, yeah, so guys as well, I know this is more of an internal sisterhood thing, but feel free to modify it. There are definitely areas that can be applied to the guy side as well. And yeah, in the new year, let's just take stock more of our mentorship journey and be more accountable with each other. So yeah, for mentors and mentees alike. And yeah, that's about it from me. I think I'll hand it over to Edward, who will do scripture reading. Thank you. Today's scripture reading is from Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Edward. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Anyone here for the first time? Just wave your hands. Anyone for the first time? No? Okay, all the second, third time people. Welcome back. Uh, by the way, do you know that in uh, Chinese tradition, today is everybody's birthday? You all know, right? Turn to your neighbour and say happy birthday. Happy birthday. I hope you all had a good Chinese New Year. Experience collecting ang pao, you know, there's uh, something I've now I'm in the giving ang pao stage, so it's not so happy for me. I was up in Malaysia, I went up to Malaysia to see my mum, you know, and uh, you know, the traffic jam was like crazy. Uh. At Tuas, uh, it's one hour, at Malaysia side, it's uh, four hours, it took me ten hours to get a KL, but that was because I went early. If I went late, you have taken 16 hours. So I woke up at three o'clock in the morning, you know, while the sky was just pitch blank, and we drove out and sat through all the traffic jam and by the time I got past Malacca, I was so tired and so sleepy I actually fell asleep at the car wheel, you know, on high speed lane, right? And the next thing I know, I was I had driven into the, the road divider, right? And thank God, uh, 
No car hit me. I didn't hit any cars. I went to see my mom, but I nearly went to see Jesus also, you know. <laughs> so I thank God because, you know, God is watching over us. Amen. Amen. Even when we don't know, even when we fall asleep, God is watching over us. Anyway, uh, we are now this week we are going to start in a series. By the way, yesterday night we had a really, really exciting prayer meeting. How many of you were there last night? Last night prayer meeting. Quite a number of you. All right. Praise so the rest of you uh, need to come to prayer meeting. Uh. Very exciting. So we are starting a new series, uh, what we call the Covenant Series this weekend. It will probably consist of about around eight sermons, not necessarily all in one row, we will have something in between. But this is a very important series and I hope an exciting series. Uh, it will cover almost everything from, I guess, Genesis all the way to, to the Gospels in the New Testament. And what we are trying to do with this series is try to discover God's purpose and vision for the church. Did you know that God has a vision for the church? That God wasn't like making up stuff it was going along, right? He wasn't just like, oh, let's see how, it's thing, how things... And uh, why don't we just... Right? When God designed you, He had a purpose. He knew why He designed you this way. Then that is why your armpit hair don't grow like your head hair, right? There is a purpose for everything that God designs. So I would imagine that for the church, for the nation of Israel, all of these things, before they were even conceived, of materially, they already existed in God's mind. So we are trying to discover what is God's vision so that we can conform ourselves to it, right? So that we can run with God in this vision. So today we really want to start a little bit from Genesis. Now, the authorship of the first five books of the Bible, uh, the first five books of the Bible, in, uh, in English sometimes they call this the Pentateuch. Have you heard this name before? The Pentateuch meaning the five books, right? But in Hebrew, it's called the Torah, right? The Torah. The first five books of the Bible, the authorship classically has been attributed primarily to Moses. Not all of it. Clearly, there are some parts that were not penned by Moses, such as the part where he says, you know, and they buried Moses on Mount Nebo. Now, clearly, he couldn't, you know, come back out and write that part, right? Has to be written by someone else, probably Joshua. Now, that's okay. But the, the majority of this content probably comes from Moses. Now, if, when you think like this, right, you think like this, you start thinking about who was Moses writing this for? Who do you think he was writing it for? Not for you, huh? He was writing it for the people who were coming out of Egypt with him, right? So that was his audience. And that means that most, if not all of Genesis, is written retrospectively, right? It was written from where Moses was looking back in time, looking into his history, looking into his past. So, of all these five books, the first book of Genesis is written, all of it is retroactively. And um, it's written as a kind of a backstory, a preamble. I don't know how many times uh, you, you watch a movie, right? You, when you start a movie, uh, they're already in some action already. Or oh, someone is shooting, jumping over. You don't know head or tail what's going on, right? Boom, 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 that, boom, the action scene ends. And then suddenly, the next scene uh, is that whoever the, I guess, the hero is, now he's just a child. Right? They're showing you the backstory, how he was abused, how he was bullied, how he was whatever, you know, got bitten by a spider or something like this, right? And that is how he got here today, right? That whole backstory is really what Genesis is written for. It's in order to help people know, hey, how did we get here? Right? It provides a framework that sets out our relationship with God. Who, who is God to us? Why are we even bothering with this God? Right? Why are we bothering with all this stuff that's uh, in the Bible? So the first 11 chapters of Genesis covers a lot of stuff very briefly, a lot of stuff, right? And I've got a slide here that roughly puts it out. It's not comprehensive, but it talks about the creation of the universe by only one God, right? Uh, it talks about the creation of man, the fall of man. It talks about origins of civilization. Where did we all come from? Where did all this stuff around us get here? The great flood and the new beginning and the origin of races and a few other things, right? So first chapter, 11 chapters, of 50 chapters of Genesis talks about a lot of stuff. And that's like the uh, 40,000 feet view of things, all right? Not a whole bunch of details, basically giving a rough lay of the land. And that's how we got here. But the moment you get to chapter 12, suddenly the plane comes down a lot. You start to see a whole lot more detail as it steps in the story of Abraham, or at that point of time called Abram. So from, uh, from that point onwards, right, we really get into what seems to be closer to the time of Moses, right? So he starts to give you more and more and more detail. So from chapter 12 onwards, 
up to chapter 50 of Genesis, all 39 chapters of it, we find the narrative of Abraham and his descendants, all through Joseph and pretty much how they wound up in Egypt. Because if you are one of those Hebrews who are in Egypt as slaves, you'll be wondering, hey, if this is our God, how did we get here? What is the story? They've been there for 400 years. Some of them were forgotten all these stories. So Moses was writing to these people and saying, guys, sit down. I'm going to tell you how we got here, who we are, where we came from, and how we got here. Right? So the author is stepping into something concerning their identity, about who they are. So that's where we wind up ourselves in Genesis 12, chapter 1 to 3. Right? Chapter 12, uh, verse 1 to 3. First thing God tells Abraham, there was this man, Abraham, out in the middle of, I guess, uh, actually, he started out in modern-day Iraq, Iraq, right? And he says to him, get out from your country, from your family, from your friends, uh, from, your fa friends from your family, from your father's house, to a land which I will show you. So first thing God tells Abraham is, Abraham, now again, uh, when you hear this, you know, I sometimes wonder, what? What actually happened? He wake up one night and he heard a booming voice from Abraham, right? Maybe that won't make him run. <laughs> Abraham, you know, get out from your country. He's like, what's this voice? Now, remember, Abraham's family did not worship Jehovah. He did not worship. They worshiped some other gods. His father, Terah, worshiped other gods, right? So he hears this voice of God. Somehow he must have known it was God. Inviting him to get out of his country. It was an invitation. It was a call. But this invitation came with a threefold promise, right? Threefold promise. This is what we call the Abrahamic covenant. It was a promise of, first of all, land. Everyone say land. Yeah. I'm going to bring you somewhere. Somewhere that's not here, right? I'm going to get you somewhere. Secondly, I'm going to give you, I'll make you into a nation. So there's a promise of nationhood, right? So you have land, over there you'll be a nation. And then this nation will become a blessing to all the other nations, to all the families of the earth. So, you know, there's this place that God is going to bring you to. Somehow, you're going to turn into a, a very big nation and that nation is going to fulfill God's purpose. So the objective is this kingdom from the very start has never been Israel itself, has never been Abraham itself. It's always been for the nations. So God's intention has, that's why you have world missions, right? That has always been the mind of God. I think our natural tendency is to do things for ourselves, but God's tendency is to do things for all His children, all the nations. That was the original, unchanging vision. And this is the foundation for everything else that actually happens in the Bible. Right? You keep in mind this thing, huh? land, nation, and the mission. These three things, wow, I'm kind of boomy here. Hello? Boom. Okay, that's an that's a echo here, right? Now, this is really quite remarkable, right? I want you to think about it for a second here. This universe, they tell, they say, has about 200 billion galaxies, right? 200 billion Milky Ways, Andromeda Galaxy, stuff like this, right? 200 billion. Each of these 200 billion or so galaxies, and those are just the ones that we can see, because there are other galaxies that you cannot see because the light cannot reach you, you see, right? Because the universe is expanding. So, 200 billion that you can see, each of them have around, oh, they're much better, their echo just disappeared, right? So, what happens is that the, each galaxy has around 200 billion stars, right? So that's a lot of stuff out there now. Lots and lots of galaxies, lots and lots of stars. And if you zoom into the Andromeda, Andromeda galaxy, actually everything you see is a star. No black space at all. It's all stars, right? Now, in each of these stars, they will have like planets orbiting it. You know? Some of these planets will be maybe like our planet. Now, it happens that in the Milky Way, there's one particular solar system in which there's the third planet from the rock, the sun, right? And that planet is called planet Earth. On that planet, today, this planet Earth, there are 8 billion human beings, almost 8 billion, 7.8 8 billion human beings alive today. Not counting all those who died in the past, right? So can you see, uh, the creator of the whole universe with all these stars, with all these different plan uh, stars and planets and galaxies, and on that little, little, one teeny, weeny, tiny planet, there's out of the seven billion, many, many millions of people potentially living, he looks for one guy. That one guy living somewhere in the desert somewhere, right? And he goes to him and says, I want you to help me fulfill the 
this vision. This is a crazy idea. I don't know. I don't know if you ever thought about that. That we are so small, and yet God chooses someone to partner with Him to bring about His vision for the entirety of humanity. Wow. I mean, that's, that's mind-blowing. All right? I, don't know, I don't know if you ever wondered, and I have to ask myself, why? Why do you suppose God wants to do that? Have it uh, occurred to you? I mean, we are like so small. You know, in a blink of an eye, we are gone. Right? On, on the grand scheme of the history of the universe, we are gone. And I, I suppose the answer has to be something along the lines that God loves you. God loves us so much that He's willing to get down through all of that stuff to look for us so that He can fulfill a particular plan and vision for humanity, for all of us. So God has a plan for you because God loves you, right? Okay, so it was at the age of 75. When God came to Abraham, he was already 75 years old, right? 75 today is not terribly old, right? But you already collect your CPF already, right? Yesterday at the prayer meeting, I say the elderly, and I said 50 to 65, and some people got offended, right? So I think I just bumped it up. 75, I think quite elderly already, right? So at the age of 75, Usually, 75, you retire already, right? You, you want to kick back, play with your grandchildren, you know. Uh, I mean, when you're growing up, uh, you're, you're your own kids, you're looking after your own kids, right? Your own kids give you all the headaches. But now you're a grandfather. You spoil your grandchildren to get back at your own kids who give you a hard time, right? That's what you do. Grand, grandparents, they just play with the kids. That's what you want to do. That was the time where you want to really settle down. Find a safe space. You don't want to be running around everywhere. But it was at 75 years old that God called Abraham to leave his home, to leave his comfort zone. Sarah, his wife, by the way, was 65 years old, right? Both also relatively old already. And it was this calling, this invitation, that is connected with that whole threefold promise, land, nation, and Mission, right? Land, nation, mission. That sounds very National Day speech kind of thing, right? But if Abraham would leave his home, he had already left his home once because he was born in a place near the mouth of the Euphrates, near where, what we call Mesopotamia, right? In Ur. His whole family travelled up along the Euphrates River, went up to what is modern-day southern Turkey, in that place, there was a town called Haran. He had settled down there. That was his retirement home. But it was at that point of time when God says, I want you to leave your comfort zone. I want you to leave your security. And if you will do this, if you will do this, you will leave all this, your family, your father's family, you leave to go to this place I'm bringing you, then I will make you part of my covenant plan. And these things will happen through you. I don't know about you. Do you think you will go? Because you know what? God is actually calling all of us. Now, most of you are, I guess, how many 17 year olders people? 17 and above here. Quite a lot of you, all right? So if you are 17 and below, right? You are 16 and below. You are still like maybe finishing up secondary school, right? At this point in your life, your comfort zone is what? Your comfort zone is actually your friends, right? This is. I would say in second, see, it's very funny. We all go through these different stages in life. In primary school, your comfort zone is still your parents, right? You want to be with your parents all the time. But somewhere in secondary school, uh, in primary school, something changes in you. I don't know if you realize that. At some point, you don't want to be with your parents anymore. In fact, sometimes your parents, you feel a bit shy. Uh, right? I, Mom, don't just, don't come here. Don't make me look like a small kid. Have you ever had that feeling before? Some of you right, are honest, right? The rest of you need to repent. But, you know, you have this, this something changes, right? Lots of things changes. When you, are, when you are primary one, teacher asks you to sit next to that girl. Ye girl, you know? Somewhere, something changes. By sec four, girl, yes, I want to sit there, right? <laughs> I mean, that, we are all going through these changes, right? So by the time you get to secondary school, I will venture to say that Probably one of the most important things to most young people are actually their friends, their friendship circle. This is your security, right? This is your comfort zone. This is where most young people derive their identity. But God is now calling some of us out of this comfort zone. You understand? Because God don't want you to stay there forever. You're supposed to grow. 
You know, in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, David was about to die. And in his dying breath, he pulls his son, Solomon, to him and says, Solomon, I'm about to go where all the earth goes, where everyone goes. In other words, I'm about to go and die. But then he says to him, be strong, be strong and be a man. Of course, the, the English Bible doesn't really phrase it that way, but in Hebrew, that's basically what it says. Be strong and be a man. Right? Be a man. I, I like that phrase, be a man. That reminds me of Russell, Russell something. Be a man, right? So, but this is, this is, the, this is the call to grow. And I guess this is what God is inviting Abraham to do. To not just remain in your comfort zone, but to grow. Because the moment you settle in your comfort zone, you stop growing, right? And all of you, you're growing. I've always observed that in modern day Singapore, in today's Singapore, you guys are growing up faster and slower at the same time, right? What do I mean by that? I mean that most of you by sec one, you already know more things uh, than people of my generation ever knew because of the internet, right? And nowadays you've got chat GPT, right? So you got all these things that's going on you, and you know stuff that none of us ever knew. None of us ever knew. Uh, you guys are using chat GPT, uh? not for your assignment, I hope, uh, right? <laughs> because the thing actually writes pretty well, good assignments. I know, I'm not using it for my sermons either, right? So, <laughs> but here's the thing, here's the thing, right? We, we get used to this thing and we don't grow anymore. We don't grow anymore. And God is saying, I want you to grow. So maybe, even as you read about God's invitation to Abraham to leave his comfort zone, maybe you can think that God is actually inviting some of you to leave your comfort zone and step into something new, a faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, it says, By faith, Abraham obeyed. That's the key. That's the key to breakthrough in our spiritual life. I can tell you that. You know, of all the things you go to Bible school, uh, you know, you get a doctoral degree, of all the things you will ever learn, uh, this is the one simple truth. You want to grow, you got to learn to obey. That's about it, you know. It's not rocket science. So Ob Abraham, he obeyed. When God says, come, he obeyed. But you know, you got to listen. Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place which he would receive, to the place where he received an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. He didn't know where he was going. In other words, this was an act of faith. And sometimes when God calls you, you don't know where you're going. When God says, I want you to leave your comfort zone. I want you to stop relying on these things that you're so familiar with. I want you to step out by faith to do something that perhaps you are feeling rather uncertain about, right? Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him in the same promise, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker, maker is God. So Abraham went out. He didn't know. He accepted the invitation. But can you just imagine how difficult this was for him? Right? 75 years old, settling down. Everything you ever lived and built all around you. And then one day you wake up and say, Sarai, we are about to go. And Sarai is asking, Abraham, where are we going? I don't know. Don't ask so many questions. Let's just pack up and go, right? And they got all their stuff, you know, got all their donkeys, mounted everything, all the servants tagging along. And off they go. They leave the house, right? They go out the front door and they're going, no GPS those days, right? So Sarai says, Abraham, yes, where are we going? I don't know where we're going. God says to go. So we are just going, right? So he's just going. And Abraham says, and Sarai says, how far are we going? I don't know how far we are going to go. We are just going. You know, it's not easy to follow God. And I guess sometimes we assume that when God calls us, you know, life is going to be all easy, one bed of roses. Actually, bed of roses is very painful. I don't know why they have that particular, <laughs> you know, uh, way of saying things. But Abraham says, if God, you say so, let's do this. Let's do this. I feel like today, that kind of invitation is still being given to Christians. And for you youth in particular, especially those of you who are going to JC, especially those of you who are going to JC, right? I feel like God is inviting you to build up your faith in a different way. Because for maybe for four years, or five years, right, you've been building up your faith upon the foundation of 
the community relationship here. But maybe at this point of time, God is calling some of you to start to obey God by faith, right? To step out of what you're familiar. And if you will say, that, you will say, yes, Lord, let's do this. I feel like God has promises for you. That God has purposes for you that you can grow into. So because Abraham said yes, that began a whole new adventure for him, right? A whole new adventure began. Now, from Genesis 12 to, let's say, 17 onwards, right? Actually, it goes up to chapter 37. But from there to the end of Genesis, a lot more stuff happens, right? I mean, he has kids, you know, and then his kids has kids. And all the people, finally, all of them end up with Joseph in Egypt. Now, you know the story about, have you watched the Prince of Egypt? Yeah, great show. I like that one, right? So if you don't know, you go home and watch that one. That will cover most of that stuff all the way up until, I guess, until they became slaves in the land of Egypt. But do you know that God already knew this was going to happen? When God called Abraham, obey me, he didn't tell Abraham. Shortly thereafter, then he told Abraham. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 12 to 13, this is a dream that Abraham had you know, after he followed. Now the sun was going down, and the deep sleep fell upon Abraham. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said, you know, it's a nightmare, lah, right? Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years. Imagine, uh, you're following God, you're obeying God. You're thinking that by obeying God, I'm going to go into this, you know, the promise that God has given me. And then you have a dream. God tells you, okay, Abraham, I just want to let you know a bit, preview, uh, no spoilers, but just let you know that your children are going to be slaves. Uh, right? Now at this point, what are you going to do? Uh, maybe you turn, right? <laughs> let's go back to Haran. Let's go back to what is safe and secure. You know, Abraham trusted God, even with this vision. And so often, so often, uh, things get worse before they get better. Seems to be the story of the Bible, right? So 400 years is a very long time. And God remembered. So it is true. By the time you get to Joseph, and after Joseph died, right, they, the children of Israel became slaves in the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 2, it says, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. And then that was the king who knew Joseph. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage and cried out. And the cry came to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning and God remembered His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged them. So if you answer God's call, sometimes you go through some, it looks like a big mess, right? And things are just going from bad to worse. But the one thing you want to know is that God is a God who remembers. You know, I'm getting to the point in life where my memory is going. My memory hasn't been great before, right? I can only remember certain kinds of things, like numbers. I can remember numbers pretty well. Right? If I see a car number, I'll remember. Right? And uh, numbers like pi, I can remember pi 3.1415926535897932384. I can do about 75 digits of this. But when it comes to people's names, right? When I see your face, I cannot remember. I just know this is a brother and this is a sister, right? And which is troublesome for a pastor. But sometimes at home, I'll find myself, I, I'll leave uh, my room, and then, uh, ah, yeah, I forgot, I need to, I'll go back in the room, I need to take something. But then now, I have a double problem, because I know I came in to get something, but I cannot remember what it was I was going to get, right? So, you know, I, I've got this problem with memory, but you know what? Thank God, God is not like us. He doesn't have a memory problem. When He makes a promise, He keeps His promise. God is a promise keeper. Amen. He is a promise keeper. So when you say yes to God, you can count on it. When you forget the God's promise, God didn't forget God's promise. So God remembered His promise. What was the promise? Land, nationhood, and the mission to bless the rest of the earth, right? But now they were all slaves. They're all just making bricks, right? Stepping on bricks, making hay, turning hay into mud bricks. How were they going to go from here to all that land, that nationhood, that being a blessing to all nations. It just seems like so impossible at the point of time. And yet, God was going to do it. Now, it was into this 
very bleak backdrop that God will raise up a deliverer for them, a man called Moses. And God always solves this problem with a man or a woman. Do you realize that? That God tends to do this. God uses people, which is why you're all here. It's a very important because God may actually be calling some of you to do something very, very significant for Him. Ever since Moses' birth, God had already marked Moses out for this task, right? Very important. Very, very important task to fulfill this whole covenant promise. And God promised. If God promised, then He cannot break His promise, right? So this Moses, since he was young, he was already marked out to perform something very, very important. However, he was not there yet. He was not there yet. For the first 40 years of his life, Moses lived, Moses lived like royalty, ate at the king's table, you know, and the king's sons received the best education Egypt could offer, walked around with the powerful and influential of the land. All this while, however, his mother was depositing in him secretly the truth about his identity, Moses. Moses, right? Remember, you're not Egyptian. I want to be like Egyptian, you know? All right? No, Moses, you're not Egyptian. You are Hebrew. Something like that must have happened somewhere along the line, right? And so, for this first 40 years of his life, he was growing in, I guess, in the best possible way, but at the same time, something else was growing in him. He, was increasing, he increasingly felt that he needed to do something for his people who were being oppressed. And after, at a point around when he was 40 years old, one day he witnessed an Egyptian oppressing his Hebrew brethren. And in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11, he decided that he's going to do something about it, right? He said, I'm going to, I'm not going to be part of the problem, I'm going to be part of the solution. He goes out and kills this one Egyptian, as if that one Egyptian is oppressing all the, all the children of Israel. But, you know, he thought, maybe I can start with this one, right? And uh, it'll take a while to kill all of them. But, you know, I'll start with this one. He kills that person. And as it turns out, he was discovered. But not only was he discovered, he was rejected by his own Hebrew brethren. He thought, nah, wow, at least my own people will sympathize with me for, you know, at least getting rid of a small part of their problem, right? But no, he was rejected because, I suppose because his own Hebrew brethren look at him looking like an Egyptian, dressed like an Egyptian, right? So you look like an Egyptian, you talk like an Egyptian, you move like an Egyptian, you are an Egyptian, but in this case, he was a Hebrew, right? So they rejected him. So because of that, he turned into a fugitive, and for the next 40 years of his life, he ran. He hid away in an obscure corner of the Median Desert. I think it's where modern Saudi Arabia is. Went all the way across the Sinai Peninsula, went all the way as far as could, crossed two bodies of water, and he hid in a corner of the desert in obscurity, right? And uh, there he marries... He hoped that everyone would forget this failed deliverer, failed hero. Wanted to be hero, end up become zero, right? So he marries Jethro's daughter, and as far as he was concerned, he was done, finished, and already, right? He spent his days being a shepherd, one of the lowliest occupations, right? So he be became a shepherd, and whatever he accumulated in the first 40 years of his life, the second 40 years of his life washed away. Gone was his opulent life of Egyptian royalty. Gone was his strength as a young man, because now he's not young anymore, right? 80 years old already. And instead of his strength and muscles, now the years has carved wrinkles into his face. Gone were the dreams of saving his people. Gone was his sense of calling. After all, he was just a pale shadow of himself. So what do you do? What do you do when the best of your plans fall through? When dreams shatter and our hopes are crushed, what do we do? What do you do? What do you do when you've done all you can and it seems like your best is just not enough and it's fallen short? What do you say when doors close in your face? You've given all you've got and there's nowhere left to turn. Well, I guess you don't give up and you don't give in, right? What do you do? You give it all you got, you don't give up. Because it was in the dark night of Moses' soul that in the rubble of his shattered purposes and dreams, in the mire of his resignation, give up already. 
It was in that night that there was a light of God in the form of a burning bush that called Moses, invited Moses. And God is always inviting, right? Moses, you think you're nothing already. Now I'm inviting you. Telling him that God was not done with him. Because when God makes a promise, He remembers His promise and He keeps His promise. That's the best thing you can know about God. Because if God keeps His promise to all these people in the past, God will keep His promise to you as well. Right? So there was Moses thinking it's done and God was still calling him. You know, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, that was a very, very good uh, verse that maybe some of you know. It says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, the day of adversity comes, the day of failing comes, right? When you are broken, the day of brokenness comes. When the day that your boyfriend and girlfriend abandon you, right? Give you up, then you'll feel like at the end of the world. All right? Put on the full armor of God when all these things happen so that you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Sometimes that's all you can do. You can just stand because there's almost nothing else. You can, you've done everything you can do. You just stand. And just because God has, a, God has a will and a plan for your life doesn't mean that it will be easy the whole way. The idea that God opens a door for us is sometimes good. But you know, a closed door can sometimes simply mean that we need to knock harder. Right? Not that we should give up. So, maybe you need to st be steadfast. I don't know what you're going through in your life today. Right? Maybe in your own spiritual life. Some of you may be coming through places, maybe like Moses. Maybe it's to do with your studies, stress, relationships. Not sure what it is that you are going through in your life. But if you will have faith, though you do not know where you're going, maybe you might hear God calling you and inviting you just like he invited Abraham, just like he invited Moses. But now you see, Moses at this point in time, he had lost all his confidence in himself. You see, up until that point in his life, he did everything in his own strength. He tried to at least, right? He did everything in his own strength. But now he had lost all confidence in himself. He no longer believes he can do it. And yet this was the time when God decides to call him. So, you know, at the age of 80, uh, God seems to like these very old people, 75 years old, you know, 80 years old, right? He begins to embark on a mission that God has prepared for him all these years, 80 years to prepare this man, to get him ready. Just when he thought the show was over, curtains closed, uh, actually the real show was just starting. But this guy, uh, He's so discouraged that he begins to give all kinds of reasons and excuses. Right? God says, Moses, I want you to speak to these people. But, but, but Lord, what if they reject me again? You know the saying, once bitten, twice shy. Is it true? If it's true, then most of you will be single forever. Uh, because sure got some rejection in your life, one, right? I mean, one rejection doesn't mean you're rejected forever. Right? Okay, I know you don't say. But let me just say for you, lah. That was saying for experience, okay? Been rejected many times before. So, they will reject me because the last time they rejected me, why they, they won't listen to me? Or, or what if they don't believe that God has sent me, right? They will be saying that, all these kind of excuses. Then he started to say, but, but I cannot speak very well, right? I'm not very eloquent. I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. But he can say all these excuses is not slow. La, but when it comes to, you know, oh my God, I can't speak very well and all these things. And that's not to mention the fact that, but, but God, you remember, I'm still fugitive. I'm still wanted for murder in Egypt. Why would I want to go back there? So he starts to give all these different excuses. It's amazing how patient God can be with some, some of us sometimes. And actually, towards the end of it, God was actually starting to get kind of angry. You can read that in the text for yourself, right? God was getting angry with Moses. Now, to Moses' credit, he did finally obey, right? And that obedience actually allowed God to bring about this covenant. Right, to bring fulfillment to a promise that he has made, to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt into the covenant promise with God. So, again, I'm skipping over a whole lot of stuff because this is all backstory. Right? You don't want the backstory to take up the whole movie, right? But this, this whole thing is the backstory of how they got to where they are. So they go through the ten plagues, and now with the Egyptian army on their backs and the sea before them, at the very first Passover, the very first Passover would be the night of their emancipation and their deliverance. 
God parted the, the sea and against all odds, against nobody could even fathom this, the children of Israel crossed on dry land into freedom. But you see, friends, this is actually where the movie starts. Now, for many people, this is where the movie ends, right? You watch Prince of Egypt, this is where the story ends. Actually, uh, in the Bible, this is where the story starts. But this is where this sermon ends, right? On the cliffhanger, of course, right? Now, I'm giving you this backstory because I want you to know a few things, right? For, for today, just a few things. First of all, God has a plan. That plan is not a very complicated plan in a sense, right? He has a plan to give, bring us to a place to make His people a nation. Or if you like, you see, in every nation, there must be a head of the state, right? So in God's nation, who is the head? God lah. God is the king. This is what you call the kingdom. In other words, the kingdom of God, right? And then this kingdom of God has a purpose. That is to be a blessing and are supposed to eventually absorb all the people into this kingdom of God. That's the first thing you need to know. But in order to do this, in order to ful fulfill this, God's plan, for a reason I cannot understand, He has tied the success of His plan to people like you and me who are willing to say yes. I mean, I wouldn't do that, you know. I, I generally, I don't know. you watch movies a lot? Do you guys watch movies? Netflix and stuff like that. You watch movies, right? I, I don't really watch a lot of movies. I generally only watch comedy, right? Uh, I like comedy. Not very stressful, though, because life is already very stressful. Why do I need to stress myself, right? But I do like action movies. I do like action movies. Lots of violence, you know, because in life you cannot do that. So you watch a movie, kind of vicariously <laughs> release all your violence. Oh, yes, uh, uh, praise the Lord. God bless you, you know. So now, one thing I don't like about action movies, ah, uh, I I like those action movies like a. Uh, uh, like let's say, what's the guy who drives a car like mad? Uh, no, 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 not that one. No, no, no. The the stat John Statham, man. transporter, right? Transporter, right? I like that show. You know why? Because that show no transporter, not transformer, transporter. <laughs> I tell you why I like the show because uh, there's no like victim girl, right? The hero can just wallop everyone. Don't have to suddenly halfway like Superman halfway then got the some girl that he must oh no, no choice you know I got to I I could destroy you right now but I can't because you got someone hostage right it really very frustrating and and so really I should not starting to forget why it was started to talk about this <laughs> right it's coming to me <laughs> okay but you know I, I I do watch these movies and I realize that there's always something that holds back the heroes of the movies. And I suppose when we look at our own life as a whole, you know, there's always something hindering the fulfillment of the plan. It's so frustrating. Whenever this happens, it's so frustrating. You wish that the hero could just run right through the enemies and just blast them to smithereens without having to get into all this emotional uh, hostage, uh, just you know, destroy them. There are a few shows like this, extremely violent shows, right? right? Basically, from start to finish, it's just hacking and slashing on, right? Then after you watch, finish the show, no emotional, no need to cry, no tears on, right? No, no pain at all. God could do th all this without us, you know, right? God could spare Himself all the grief of having to deal with people like us. You understand? People like you and me, now you're honest about it, we are so deeply flawed. We are so, so, so deeply flawed. And we are honest about it, we have failed God so, so, so many times. Am I right? We have done it. God knows it. So it's perplexing to me. Why would God tie this grand plan, covenant plan, kingdom plan, His plan for all of humanity, why would He tie it to folks just like you and me who are so deeply flawed? I mean, even we don't believe in ourselves sometimes. But God, the creator of the universe, says, I believe in you. Abraham, I believe in you. And Moses, you can be a pain, but I believe in you. Right? And David, you got a couple of good things, but not a few bad things either. And yet I believe in you. And friends, today, God is looking at all of you. And God is saying, well, I believe in you. 
notwithstanding all your failings. But now it's up to you to say, okay, God, I don't believe in me, but since you believe in me, let's do this. You know, and you say yes. And God uses us to fulfill His covenant plan. You see where I'm going with this? So maybe all of you really need to think about it, especially all you JC people. Huh? God may be calling you to think about where you're going with this. And sometimes the older you get, the more cynical you get about life. Because you see how many times you yourself fail. Our God uh, specializes in using failed people. Uh. You understand? God specializes in using people who are not perfect. So tonight, uh, not tonight, uh, this afternoon, uh, as we finish this, why don't we just close our eyes for a little bit, right? And I don't know which part of this story may connect with you. Some of you, maybe you are like Moses in the Median Desert at a very low point in your life. If you are there, I have to say to you, don't give up and don't give in. God is not done with you. You might find it hard to believe. You look at yourself and say, can it be? How can it be that God is not done with me? And I'm just telling you, God is not done with you. Because out in the darkness of that night comes a burning bush. So maybe for some of you are there. Some of you, maybe you are kind of settled down, I don't know, in your comfort zone, whatever that comfort zone may be. And God comes to you just when you think, you know, you, you, are, you are about to settle into something else and God says, leave the comfort zone. Wherever you are today, maybe you can respond to God because, again, for the strangest reason that I cannot understand, God has predicated His plan upon our willingness our faith in Him. So dear Lord, would you look upon all of us right now, all these young men and women here, and Lord, to help them to be strong and be a man, be a woman, be the person that you want them to be, Lord. So well, we commit ourselves to you even as we embark on this journey, as we start to begin to discover what your purpose for our lives are. In the name of Jesus we ask and we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll save the altar call for other time. Lah. Yes. Yeah. Can I just invite us to rise for the closing song? Yeah, you know, um, thank you, Pastor Daniel, for the sermon. Um, yeah, I think I think it's very easy to lose sight of what God's promises are for our lives. There's really is so much that we think we know, and so much that we think is better than the plans that God has for us. And honestly, that's, that's very normal. Right? We're all just very prideful people. Uh, yeah, let's just sing this song today um, as a form of surrender. We're going to sing uh, No Longer Slaves, which, which has the line, I'm no longer a slave to fear, for I am a child of God. And you know, we, we really just want to be children. Right? And what do good children do? They obey. So yeah, today as we sing these words, I think my prayer for us is that we just we just all learn to be better children, you know, to learn to obey the God who we know has a good plan for our lives. Yeah. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. Of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God. Well, I'm no longer a slave to fear 
you that you are our Heavenly Father, you have a purpose for every one of us, whether we realise, we are aware, whether even we believe it or not, Lord. So, but today, even as we go from this place, may we go with this assurance of your embrace, Lord, that there is a God who believes in us above all our own weaknesses, flaws and failings. So now, even as we go, may we go with a blessing, the greatest blessing of all, the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit remain with us and our families and friends now and always. Amen. And as we sing the, the closing song, you know, um, the thing that came back to my mind was this scene where during the youth camp, somebody came up to me to ask for prayer. And I was about to pray, I just sensed the Lord telling me to tell the guy, you know, just, just, just look at the lyrics. And the song happened to be the song, I'm the child of God. And, and, I, and at the end of it, I asked the person, and the person said, yeah, that was what God has been saying to him. And so today, 
you know, the same message to all of us here. If today you are doubting whether you know God loves you, whether God cares for you, about your identity, know today that God, God loves you, because God is love. And because He loves you, He loves all of us. Today, I think I believe He wants to pour out His love into us. Okay, and we know that you know when something increases, something has to decrease. So as the love of God comes into us more and fills us more, the negative things, you know, and all the negative things should be leaving us. And so um, as we close, you know, um, the front will be open for prayer. The prayer companions will pray for you, for you. So if you sense the Lord, you know, wanting to deposit something in your heart, come forward to be prayed for. Okay. Um, uh, so the service is over, but please, uh, those of us who want to leave, please leave quietly. And those of us, if you, st- if you don't want to come forward, but you just want to have this um, personal you know, s- time with the Lord, please continue to stay in this presence. Okay, that we won't on the light, but we'll keep this place dark so that you can have this interaction, this time with the Lord. And those of you who want prayer can come forward. The rest of you who need to go for cell, please leave quietly. Okay, you can go downstairs. And uh, remember to say thank you to the aunties who will be giving us all the funds.